Thank you so much for having me. Robin, as we kick off today's discussion, why don't you start off by sharing with us how the debate over gun violence prevention has changed since you joined the Giffords Law Center, which was named, of course, after Gabby Giffords, uh, who survived the assassination attempt. What, what have you learned over time? How have things changed and how does it brought, how's it brought you to this moment? You know, I actually started doing this work in 2006, long before Giffords was formed. I ran a different organization and we combined with G Giffords, Gabby Giffords and her organization about five years ago. So I've been doing this work for 15 years and I don't even know where to begin to explain how very much has changed in the last 15 years. In many ways, it's a completely different problem and space than it was back then. Um, for one thing, you have groups like Everytown now um, putting you know, a lot of resources, bringing a huge grassroots movement into the space that wasn't there 15 years ago. In fact, wasn't even there 10 years ago um, when Gabby was shot. So we have this tremendously more vibrant movement um, and in the political space, which we'll talk a bit more about later, um, really this used to be a third rail issue that no one was willing to talk about very much in the political arena. And now not only do we have champions who are running on a gun safety platform, but they're winning. It's a winning platform for so many. And that is just a huge change. And I attribute some of that um, to the kinds of mass shootings that have really woken up, I think, a lot of Americans to how very relevant this issue is to all of us. And I think in part to a lot of new energy in the space, you know, not just Giffords, but so many others. It's really um, become a truly momentum driven movement that especially over the last few election cycles, we're seeing tremendous progress. And there's been tremendous progress at the state level, even if not quite yet at the federal level. So I'm sure we can talk more about that progress, but it really is inspiring to know how much has shifted over time and all the progress we truly are making. All right, well, if it's okay with you, I'm going to take over here. Um, I'm not sure if I have uh, John and Fred on the screen, but hopefully they can. I'm here. Okay, John, we have John and um, all right. So I'm gonna start um, just by talking to you a bit, John, about sort of the larger scope of the problem. Um, you know, both of us doing work in this space. And by the way, hello, nice to see you um, even virtually. Um, you know, we've been doing this work a long time. And, and if anything, unfortunately, the, you know, more than 100 Americans every day killed with guns, you know, almost 250 shot and wounded every day. Those numbers, they go up and down, but we're not, especially after COVID, in the best position. So talk to me a bit about the steps every town is taking to keep guns out of the hands of those that shouldn't have them and to reduce the toll of this terrible you know, epidemic in this country. Thank you, Robin. Yeah, and I think, look, those numbers are uh, terrifying and um, that you just quoted, and, and certainly uh, they depict the human cost, which is so devastating. But I think we should also think about the steep financial cost, because sometimes those are the, that's the data that will convince some uh, elected officials to actually engage. And a recent report that every town put out uh, uh, showed that annually it was costing this country about $280 billion uh, uh, in just uh, hard dollars uh, uh, being the cost of gun violence, whether you're talking about long-term care or court and prison costs or lost earnings. Um, and I think that as people talk about this issue, um, it's important to talk about both sides of this because sometimes uh, you don't know what's going to actually bring somebody uh, to an awakening of the tremendous costs uh, that this country is incurring, whether it's in human tragedy or economic costs. And, and to answer your question, uh, look, this is a complicated issue, um, and I think that it's important to have lots of tools in your tool be belt uh, to be able to fight it. But just let me back up a minute and talk about how we got involved in this issue, uh, because I think it gives you sort of some sense of the challenges. Um, I was Mike Bloomberg's chief policy advisor. We started to get involved in this issue for the same reason that virtually every mayor in the country is engaged in this issue, because when you really talk about who are the public figures that get that call at two and three o'clock in the morning, uh, it's mayors who are called to emergency rooms uh, because a cop is shot or a kid is killed uh, uh, on a playground or some other uh, mass form of mass shooting. 
And it's mayors that actually are the ones that are going to break the news, that's going to break some family's heart. Um, and we got involved by organizing mayors because we thought that they were non-ideological uh, and they were the closest to the problem and started to really raise our voice in Washington. And with some success, it was hard going. But then uh, at Sandy Hook happened. Um, and it was at that moment that so many people around the country thought, well, this is the opportunity. This is the moment where the country are going to come together and pass common sense laws. Uh, and it didn't happen. And uh, to Robin's point, when you sort of go back and think about this politically, uh, it didn't happen, not just because Republicans opposed it, but there were Democrats who opposed it at that time as well. Uh, they just didn't want to touch it. It was like touching a hot stove, they thought. Uh, in Robin's words, it was sort of the third rail of American politics. And we decided after Sandy Hook and the failure of the legislation to pass to take a step back. And what we realized uh, were two things. Uh, one was that the gun lobby was really noisy and really effective. Um, and as Robin said, there was no such noise being generated on the gun safety side. The NRA could put out an emergency alert and suddenly the switchboards on Capitol Hill and in state capitals lit up like it was the 4th of July. Um, and so what we felt was uh, that we absolutely needed to grow a grassroots and we were extraordinarily fortunate uh, to merge uh, seven years ago with Moms Demand Action, uh, which has so effectively filled the gap um, in having a grassroots. But the second thing that we decided was you don't knock your head against the same wall over and over again and expect a different result. And so we decided that in some instances, um, you know, Congress is the curtain raiser and sometimes it's the finale. And in this case, it was probably gonna be the finale and the smartest thing to do was go state by state, uh, which is a really good proxy for showing where the American public stands on this issue with the hope that it would eventually influence Congress much in the same way uh, that the marriage equality movement went state by state after facing failure um, at the federal level. Um, and so, we have with certainly from our perspective, those two decisions have allowed us to move the needle, uh, certainly at the states uh, at the states. And it's it's really the combination of uh, pushing legislation and pushing uh, the grassroots voice. But, you know, our our understanding of this issue has evolved. Uh, there's no question about it. Um, and I would say that I would really point to five things that have to be in place to really reduce uh, gun violence in this country. One is you have to change the political calculus. Uh, and I think that we are on the road to doing that. Uh, every town spent almost $60 million, for instance, in 2020 uh, in supporting um, elected officials and actually holding others accountable. Uh, and I think that you would have to search pretty darn hard these days to find a Democrat who would vote against this issue and increasingly at the state level, you're finding Republican governors signing gun safety bills as they did in Florida uh, after Parkland. Uh, the second, obviously, which I've al already talked about is changing laws and that happens by electing the right people. It happens by bringing grassroots pressure. Those are the two obvious ones that people always talk about, but I think there's several others. Uh, one is you have to change the culture. Uh, behavior doesn't only change by changing laws. Uh, you know, think about, for instance, um, the, the uh, automobile industry and uh, 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 safety, auto safety. Laws were important, but it was also things like designated drivers that were important, which was a behavioral change uh, that didn't come about through a legislative change. And so behavioral change is extraordinarily important. Uh, the fourth I would put is holding the industry accountable. And this is the most difficult one because the NRA teamed up years ago uh, with Congress to protect the industry. Uh, just think where we'd be uh, with uh, tobacco or auto safety or pharmaceuticals if you weren't able to sue. Uh, but largely that has been the case, except for our efforts uh, that Robbins has been able to do, every town has been able to do to try to circumvent 
uh, those laws, but uh, very important. And then the final thing I would say is uh, it's important to look at the supply side. How do guns get into uh, 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 the hands of criminals or get onto city streets? But you, you've got to actually invest in community-based solutions as well. Um, and very pleased that all of us in the gun safety movement have urged the Biden administration to provide stable funding uh, for some of the uh, evidence-based, community-based solutions uh, that really work on a block-by-block -block, uh, level. So those would be the five things I would say you have to invest in. I see I'm muted. Thank you for that. That was a lot. And I, as you were speaking, I had so many things I wanted to dig in on about what's happening at the yeah, state. Come in, Joss. Um, can you hear me? It's good. Um, and PLACA and the shift towards, you said supply side, and I often think of some of the community issues as demand side, what's happening in these communities that needs to be addressed at the root cause level. So there's a lot of things I wanna touch in on that, but before we sort of circle back to a lot of, I think the really, really important things you just raised that are happening within the movement, many of the new um, parts of what we've all been doing. You and I were working together with Mayors Against Illegal Guns and we were really just focusing on you know one or two issues. And now we all have this very broad range of levers that we're trying to pull, whether it's you know affirmative litigation or or you know, community violence intervention, culture change, it's, it needs to all happen simultaneously. Um, and so I think that's an exciting development that I think have kept you and I engaged for so many years and trying to solve this puzzle. Um, but I do wanna turn it over to Fred. Um, and Fred, I um, just wanna start by um, acknowledging how difficult this work must be for you and how courageous it is that you stand in this space knowing underneath that what must be um, some really difficult um, memories and feelings and and you know motivating but also I'm sure not easy. Um, I, I remember I spoke when I spoke at that Senate or the House Judiciary hearing back in 2019 and um, it's kind of exciting Val Demings is here because I think she sort of stole the show that day a little bit but um, you were there also and I yeah. remember how how much had changed in the 12 years I had spoken 12 years before and it was all these gun rights people in the audience and when I went to speak that day the entire room was filled with March for Our Lives students and Parkland parents and it if nothing else that showed me the transformation in the space to have those people showing up at five in the morning to, to fill the room and you were there um, but I want to talk to you a bit about what you've experienced in this work over the last three years, how you have found this space, what has changed, what you feel really works best in, mm -hmm. in bringing change to this issue, you know, sort of from your very um, specific perspective. Yeah, listen, I, I, I thank you. And I, and I remember that hearing, you know, yesterday was Father's Day and I'm a father who had to spend it without my daughter. This week, my daughter was supposed to graduate and I went to graduation to collect a shadow box because she won't be graduating. I watch as all of her friends graduated. So you wanna know what it takes to succeed. The night after my daughter was killed, I went to the um, Parkland vigil. And when there I was asked to speak and standing there in front of everyone from Parkland, it, it, for the first time my world slowed down and it like hit me, this was gun violence. And I walked in my house that night and I said, I'm gonna break that effing gun law. And it has been my life's mission since because we have to remove them from holding our legislators and our legislation hostage. They have been the issue. But I see Representative Val Demings is on the screen. So I'm gonna tell you what else changed my life. It was a week later when I went to the CNN town hall because you're running against a guy who couldn't use the word guns that entire week. When I tell you it infuriated me and I had the chance to talk to him at that town hall, um, I learned that night, never shut up. And I will never shut up. Last week, when it came time to commemorate what happened at Pulse and he put out a truly moronic tweet by the way, he wouldn't allow replies on the tweet. And he also didn't mention guns as a factor in what happened at Pulse or who was killed. It only reinforced how important it is 
that we never stop using our voices, that we put out candidates who are willing to fight, and that we all show up and vote. Because guys like Rubio, they are the problem. And we've got to get them out of office. They, you, if you look right now in Washington, D.C., and it is so much, I, I, I can't say enough how much I appreciate my friends at every town, at Giffords and at Brady, okay? We have the House. They're passing legislation. We have a president. He's ready to sign the legislation. And we have this roadblock still in the Senate, even though the Democrats control it. And so it is time now to push the Senate. We've got to increase the lead of the Democrats in the Senate. But we're going to have to demand the Democrats go it alone on this. There is a non-governing party. They have said they will not join. And we can't stop screaming and yelling until something happens. Because honestly, if we do stop, the next time it could be your kid. And I don't want that to happen. And so this is why we fight. We can't stop. It's everything to me. I'm a dad. That's all I am. I'm not a political person. But I don't want... Let me just say it like this. My daughter was a cost of doing business for a gun lobby, and it is time to break their grip on our safety. So thank you. Robin, I'm going to break in for a second. First of all, Fred, thank you. Uh, but I, I would like to just uh, introduce my friend and former colleague, uh, Congresswoman Demings. Uh, Congresswoman, thank you for being here. Uh, it's a special privilege. You uh, obviously are very much involved and your experience, your professional experience really lends itself uh, to this moment. But uh, I'm going to have Lauren Baer, who's one of our next gen board members, uh, make the introduction to you. And uh, we look forward to your comments. Lauren. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ron. Um, as a Floridian, I am absolutely thrilled to introduce Congresswoman Val Demings, who has represented Florida's 10th congressional district for the past four years. And as Fred mentioned, is presently running for US Senate against Marco Rubio. Congresswoman Demings is one of our country's fiercest advocates for gun violence prevention. After spending 27 years with the Orlando Police Department, including four years as chief, Representative Demings has seen the damage that gun violence has done to our communities and knows just how essential policy reform is to keeping all of us safe. Two months ago, Representative Demings introduced the Law Enforcement Protection Act, which would regulate concealable assault weapons in order to keep both police officers and our community safe. And just last month, Representative Demings introduced the Protecting Our Communities Act, another vital package of legislation that will prevent gun violence. Representative Demings has proven time and again her commitment to comprehensive gun violence prevention. And we are so grateful that she is here with us today. Congresswoman, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Well, Lauren. I'm mute. Yes, you're muted. There you go. Okay. Let me say good afternoon to all of you and Robin, Lauren, thank you so much uh, for that kind introduction. Um, Ron, thank you, it's great to see you as well. I'm honored to be here. Uh, I wanna thank the Jewish Democratic Council for this opportunity. You know, I had a moment um, not too long ago, a couple of weeks ago now, I guess, to spend some time with Fred. It's good to see you again. And I also heard you last week talk about um, Jamie would have been graduating uh, this year, uh, but instead uh, she is no longer with you. And I think that's such a powerful statement because Jamie represents thousands of people that we have lost to gun violence that should be still with us today, enjoying their lives, doing what normal people and normal families do, um, graduate from high school, graduate from college, celebrate weddings, celebrate birthdays, but instead they're no longer uh, with us. I do believe that we are the greatest nation in the world, but I also believe that we have an obligation to hold America uh, to that promise. Uh, as a police chief, 
You know, I spent 27 years at the Orlando Police Department. One of my top priorities was to get crime guns off of our streets, i.e. to get guns out of the hands of people who should have never had them uh, in the first place, out of the hands of criminals, out of the hands of the mentally ill, and out of the hands of terrorists. And I asked you, uh, who would not want that? Uh, our number one responsibility is the safety and security of the people that we represent. We can talk all day long about health care and unemployment and wages and education and housing and even COVID-19. But it does not really, none of that really matters is if the foundation on which we build a great nation is not solid. The safety and security of the people that we represent has to be our number one concern. Now, I've seen this nation come together doing some of the toughest things and doing some pretty miraculous things. This one should not be that tough. I asked the question in, in a judiciary hearing one day and one of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle to hear this because uh, I asked the question, what life? Tell me what life is not worth saving. We have a saying that when we see something, we're supposed to say something so we can do something. We've got to continue to do something about this issue. Yes, in the House of Representatives, we've passed uh, background checks, which we know about 80%, if not more, uh, of Americans, people in this country, uh, approve and support. But there's also other pertinent legislation that is just sitting to for action uh, in the Senate. And we've got to do better. When we know better, we are supposed to do better. How many mass shootings have we read about, seen the footage on television just over the last two weeks? And so we've got to do better. And again, as I said, live up to America's promise. As a police chief, it was my number one priority. Every time a person was gunned down in my area, in my area of jurisdiction, I took it personally because it was our primary responsibility. And so, as I said, I worked on this issue long before I was elected to Congress. I have no intentions on stopping that work now. And I am very grateful for all of you who share this as a priority. Thank you for advocates like Fred. We're so glad that you are advocating for this. Jamie could have no better advocate than her father. Um, and so again, everybody, thank you. So thank you all so much for giving me this opportunity. You. So first of all, Representative Demings, thank you so much for joining us here today. I will never forget your comments in that House Judiciary hearing where I testified because you really came through with so much passion and so much um, personal energy for this cause and a willingness to really speak truth to power in a way that I think is so important. Um, and I wanna sort of touch on a few things. What was talked about a bit before was how much this issue is, is frontline for mayors, for police chiefs, who are the ones that really confront the day-to-day -day impact that gun violence has on our community. So I wanted to sort of ask you two parallel questions. One is just how your background in law enforcement and understanding the issue from that perspective really informs how you approach this issue. And the second, which is sort of related is, you know, with such a polarizing issue before us, it's polarizing in our legislature, it's polarizing in the public. How do we find a way to move that forward? How does the voice of police chiefs and mayors help us? How do you think now that you're um, in Congress, how do we shift that um, reality in a, you know, going forward way? Well, Robin, thank you so much uh, for that question. And, and let me just start here. Uh, when I served at the Orlando Police Department, 27 years, had the honor of serving as the chief of police, I could not tell you the political party of the overwhelming majority of the men and women that I served with. We had one mission, and that was to keep Orlando a safe city to reduce 
violent crime and keep people safe. And we were all focused on that mission. When I was elected to Congress, I took that same spirit and same attitude to Congress that we will get things done on behalf of the American people with our first priority being to keep them safe. Because as I said earlier, nothing else really matters because safety is the foundation on which we build great things uh, in this country. And so I just applaud, you know, when the federal government who certainly plays a critical role uh, fails us, then I have been extremely proud of local jurisdictions, local mayors, police chiefs and others who have stepped up, that's why I stepped up and made getting crime guns out of the hands of dangerous people a priority working in conjunction with our mayor uh, here in Orlando. And so really fill in that gap, but wouldn't it be nice in some of the states where we have leadership that does not see this as a priority. So if they don't see the reduction of gun violence as a priority, then I say they don't see the safety and security of the people that they represent as a priority because the two, as we so painfully know, go together. And so wouldn't it be nice though, when states fail us, if the federal government would pass legislation that would protect the American people. And so, you know, when I heard Fred say earlier that, look, it would be nice because this it should not be a democratic issue or a Republican issue. This is a American people issue. 100%. But we have to be prepared. I mean, how many times since we have passed um, H.R. 1446, uh, dealing with the Charleston loophole of past the background checks, uh, HR 8. How many mass shootings had we, have we seen since that legislation was passed? And so look, we'd like to not have to go it alone, but we have a direct responsibility and obligation to protect the American people. And if we have to go it alone, then we have to be uh, prepared to to do so. And so I have to say that, you know, when I look historically in this country with this complicated history, also historically, during some of the toughest moments that we've had or experienced, we've always had the ability to come together on the right side of the aisle and the left side of the aisle to get things done. We are seeing unbelievable, unprecedented obstruction right now, which is shameful which is disgraceful. The people of Florida deserve better. The people around this nation deserve better. So it's all about keeping people safe. And if we have to go it alone, then we need to go it alone. I couldn't agree more. One of the comments that John Feinblatt raised earlier was about the, the cost and the toll that gun violence takes on this country, not just in terms of lives, which obviously um, is the greatest toll that it takes, but also in terms of money and how the investment that we can make in this issue returns many times over um, with saved costs, saved lives and saved resources across the board. And I think really the American people, uh, my hope is that as there's more and more information coming out that we'll see that. Um, I have one quick follow-up question, then I have some more questions for our other panelists, but I want, I wouldn't I was hoping you could tell us a bit about the legislation you've recently introduced, the Law Enforcement Protection Act, Protecting Our Communities Act, um, where that stands a little bit about what that intends to do and how those watching, we have hundreds of people tuning in today, how those watching can help support those efforts going forward. Well, <clears throat> one of the piece of, pieces of legislation, the Law Enforcement Protection Act is all about modifications of certain weapons uh, to make them appear to be handguns, but guns that are fall in the assault weapons category, if you will, have to be uh, receive different kinds of uh, regulations. And so that particular piece of legislation will make sure that those modified weapons receive the proper regulations, which will require them to be registered. Another piece of legislation deals with ghost guns, for example, and you may have heard a lot about that. 
Now we're doing all that we can to keep guns out of the hands of bad people. And the majority, as I've said, of the American people are on our side on that issue. But imagine if you, so background checks are, are important, an important part of this process. But imagine if you could order parts through the internet, internet of the mail, have them arrive at your residence and just build a weapon that has no serial numbers, that's certainly not registered, that's certainly not regulated in any way, that you could just order those parts and build them. So there is a concerted effort to make sure that we outlaw ghost guns of any kind. And so those are two critical pieces of legislation, I believe, are, uh, are, are so important and so uh, necessary at this time. I couldn't agree more. It's been uh, good to see President Biden leaning into the ghost gun problem and now ATF is doing rulemaking to address it. So thankfully, we're going to hopefully see some very quick progress on that particular problem. And Robin, if, I could, if I could just add this very, very quickly too. You know, there are, there's a concerted effort out there that's been around for a while as well that will try to make you, me, and everybody else on this call and everybody else who may be listening believe that this has something to do with the Second Amendment. Uh, I've dedicated my life. I took an, I've taken five oaths now. And each of them said that I will protect and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I've taken each of those oaths very, very seriously. My father was a hunter. He was the owner of several guns. I, I, I can remember some days, I don't think we would have eaten had he not been able to go out and, and find dinner for us. I've served in a profession uh, where I carried a gun for 27 years. I am a gun owner. This is not about taking guns out of the hands of good, decent, law-abiding citizens, which we know the evidence shows are with us, the overwhelming majority are with us on this issue. This has nothing to do with the Second Amendment. I say that as a former police chief, and I say that as a member of Congress. This is about keeping guns out of the hands of dangerous people. We just recognized the fifth anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting where 49 people lost their lives, people who were in a place where they had every right to be, celebrating friendships, relationships, birthdays, family. And they were gunned down by someone who should have never had a gun in the first place. We've got to do uh, something about that. Congresswoman, I know that your, your staff is telling us your schedule uh, is, is, is moving along here. So uh, we wanna thank you for your passion and, and most importantly, your substantive approach to this very, very important issue. I know that I speak for uh, the people that have listened today, as well as our guests uh, that are your colleagues, uh, your your role in the Congress, uh, in the House, and, and hopefully in the Senate as well, uh, is, is a very important one. You speak from your own experience, and that's the most passionate form of persuasion that someone can bring to the table in this conversation. So we thank you. Please uh, be safe and, and uh, continue good work on, on, on our behalf. And with thank that, you. I'm going to turn it thank, thank, thank you very much. Take care. Thanks, Congresswoman. I'm going to turn it out now over to our executive uh, uh, CEO, Haley Seufer, please. Great. Thank you so much, Ron. Well, that was very powerful. And I am compiling all of your uh, questions that have come in from the audience. And it looks like overwhelmingly the audience was responding to Representative Deming. So I'd like it to turn it back to the panel, starting with you, Fred, and then to John and to Robin, because you all are the experts, to respond to Representative Demings and some of the key issues that she spoke about that are most meaningful to you. And and Fred, because you're speaking to a group of Jewish Democrats, uh, we're also wondering how your Jewish values shape your advocacy on this issue. Well, I'll start there. Um, and I think my parents are on this. So from Ohio, um, which kind of gets to a little bit about my Jewish values. Uh, you know, I was raised to always do what's right, to always do good, to always do for others. 
And that's who I am. I don't know how to be anybody else. You know, honestly, what happened to my family has shaken my faith in a higher power. But my Judaism, in terms of the way I was raised, in terms of the way I act and react, is still my core. It's my foundation. And um, it guides me, you know? So I, I just, as a, as a dad, I just want to keep doing what I do to help ensure other families don't have to go through what we're going through. Um, as, as it relates to what Congresswoman Demings was saying, I, I think I want to pick up first on the Second Amendment piece. Because as probably everyone on here knows, with the last guy in the White House, I was removed from the State of the Union and detained when he said, your Second Amendment rights are under attack and I will defend them. And everyone jumped up and clapped and started screaming. And I said nine words. What about victims of gun violence like my daughter? And for that, I got detained. Here's why I did it. The Second Amendment argument has always been the big lie. This has never, ever, ever been about the Second Amendment. Gun safety is not an affront to the Second Amendment. You know, last week I started this whole uh, Dads for Gun Safety movement, which basically says you can be a dad, a gun owner, and for gun safety. The Second Amendment lie has always been a lie. What dealing with gun violence is, what gun safety is, is a public health issue. We've already got 400 million weapons on the street. We're not getting rid of gun violence, sadly, but we can reduce the gun violence death rate. We can decrease the instances of gun violence. We can decrease the severity of gun violence injuries when they happen. She also talked about ghost guns. Um, one of my friends who I wish I never knew, Brian Mullenberger, who lost his beautiful daughter, Gracie, in the Saugus High School shooting uh, in California about two years ago, he did something that just highlighted how horrible the situation is because his daughter was 14. And after she was murdered, he went online in her name, even though she was 14 and no longer alive, and in her name ordered all of the components to be shipped to their house to make a ghost gun. And he was able to do it successfully. If there is if there is not an example more egregious than that about why we as a country have to step up and do more, I don't know of it. So I truly appreciate that it came up and it was discussed. I'll just say this. Um, it is time for us to stop allowing the gun lobby to dictate our safety. I believe in bipartisanship. Gun safety is bipartisan. 90% or so of Americans want gun safety. So to say that we need to go it alone because the other party refuses to protect our, us, those we love, that's not being partisan. That's right now being realistic. And if we want to do anything to get a start on reducing that gun violence death rate, it looks like we're going to have to go it alone. So I appreciate you asking me the question. Absolutely. Thank you. John, over to you to respond to some of the key issues that Representative Demings mentioned, but also to tell us all, what are some steps that we can take to move the needle on this issue and to actually see an end to the epidemic of gun violence? Yeah, thank you. And, and Fred, thank you. As always, uh, you are an inspiration. Uh, and gives all of us who are working on this issue so much strength. But one of the things I wanted to pick up on is something that both Fred said and Representative Deming said, which is that the majority of the American public are with us. I mean, no matter what poll you look at, you find 85 to 90% of the public uh, want stronger gun safety laws. And it could be a poll that was paid for by Republicans or a poll that was paid for by Democrats, but yet still, we aren't able to uh, make progress in the US Congress. And, and I think we have to talk about why. Uh, and Fred uh, uh, referred to it, which is the power of the gun lobby. And I wanna talk particularly about the NRA. 
um, uh, because I think it's really important for people to realize uh, that the NRA is not just about the issue of guns. It's not just about the issue of uh, blocking progress on guns. In fact, the NRA in many respects has been the foot soldiers of the far right. Um, and I think for any of us who are concerned about democracy, any of us who are concerned about gun safety or any of us who are concerned about a number of the, the other issues that I know this organization cares about, you have to think about the NRA and you have to think about uh, what they talk about. Uh, you have to th think about how they feed their members and it's all really about resisting democracy. And I think that we should all care deeply about this, whether you're a gun safety advocate like Fred and I are, or you're just somebody who believes in government. The NRA does not. Now, the good news is uh, the NRA is under the harshest spotlight that they've ever been in probably their 150 years of existence. As many of you know, they are chartered in the state of New York. And uh, Tish James, our attorney general here has brought uh, regulatory action against them um, based on uh, a number of things, including their misuse of members' funds, uh, their cozy relationship with their board, their board uh, abandoning their fiduciary duties, on and on. It is a powerful lawsuit. It is not a show suit, uh, it's real. Uh, and the NRA is doing everything in their power to get out from under it, including last month uh, going on trial in da a Dallas bankruptcy court to try to evade and stay the actions of the New York Attorney General. Thankfully, after a three week trial, uh, their strategy failed. Um, and uh, the cost to them, I think, is huge of the failure because it provided testimony uh, that was cringeworthy. And in fact, it, um, it during depositions, their CFO of 25 years took the fifth 80 times. And let me tell you, uh, based on my experience as a criminal lawyer, if your CFO of 25 years is taking the fifth 80 times, uh, he's not the only one who's uh, shaking uh, in their boots. Uh, but never forget the fact that when you think about the NRA, don't think just about guns. Think about the pillars of democracy because they want to topple it. So what do you, what do, you do? Uh, how do you get involved? I think if you are a political donor, uh, the one thing I would say is you have to make it clear that this is your number one issue. You will not support people who are not going to advocate for the passage of gun safety laws, and you're going to ask them the question specifically. You have to put it to the test, and you have to make it clear that you will not support uh, uh, any elected official who is running, who is not going to advocate, vote for, talk about the issue of gun safety. Um, if uh, you are just somebody who wants to get involved, uh, you can join uh, Moms Demand Action. You can enjoy the new movement that Fred uh, is uh, just spoke about, but get involved, get involved. Noise, being noisy works. And uh, this is an issue that until, uh, you know, really seven or eight years ago, as Robin said, wasn't noisy. Uh, but uh, that's the way things happen uh, in this country. Um, and so uh, the third thing I would say is, and I'll leave it at that, if this is an issue that you care about, talk to your neighbors about it. Talk to your friends about it. Uh, get other people involved in the issue uh, because the truth is the more people are involved, the more people who talk about this, the more people who are gonna make this a litmus test and hold their elected officials accountable, that's how stuff happens in this country. Thank you so much. And to our one-time moderator, now co-panelist, Robin, uh, for the last question, uh, if you too would like to respond, but specifically, I wanted to ask you that 
you know, this is such a difficult issue, uh, the fight for common sense gun legislation. It's been going on for decades uh, with uh, at times little to no progress. What gives you hope to keep pushing from reform for reform? And uh, what can we all look to in terms of possible opportunities for success in the near term? Thank you so much for that question. I'm gonna be brief because I know we're getting close to the end of our time here, but the main thing that gives me hope besides what you've heard today about the actually amazing progress we've made in the last, I would say 10 years since the shooting at Sandy Hook Elementary School, which really brought forth the shift in the American public consciousness about this issue and the impact it has on every single one of us. This isn't an issue, this isn't someone else's problem. This is all of our problem with 120 or 130,000 Americans shot every year. This is touching just millions of people in this country and, and just ripping apart families and communities. So I think in the last 10 years, that that's really come to the forefront. Um, and I think we're seeing a lot of change as a result of that shift, not just in the political space, mostly at the state level, but also just generally, as John was saying, the willingness of people um, to talk about this issue, to make this an issue that is a primary concern for them when they pull people leaving you know, the voting booths. This is always not now on the top three issues that they care about in voting. So, and that's new, that is not the case um, before that. So this has really shifted. And I'll just end by saying the greatest hope I have isn't just the inspiration I find from folks like Fred um, and Mark Barden and others who, for the worst possible reason, are making this their life's work and trying to help people to wake up to the just devastating impact. The thing that gives me the most hope is knowing that we can solve this problem. There are solutions to the gun violence epidemic. There are policy solutions, there are program solutions, whether it's background checks and everything that flows from background checks or community violence intervention strategies, suicide prevention, safe storage in the home. I could go on, but I can assure you all that we know how to solve this problem. John and I and Fred and others working in this space, we have the solutions based on research. We can do this. What we need is politicians who have the political will, who have the willingness to face this issue down, to be willing to implement those solutions on a comprehensive federal basis in the meantime, on a comprehensive state level, we can solve this. And that gives me hope because I know that this isn't the insurmountable problem that you're told it is, that there's nothing we can do. It's just the way it's gonna be because we have so many guns. That's simply not true. And so the hope I find is knowing if we keep fighting and we will eventually win because we're in the place of right, that we will eventually begin to reduce this problem. And that's what keeps me going every single day. Thank you so much. And thanks to all of our panelists for the passion and deep commitment that you've brought to this critically important issue. I'm now gonna turn it over to Bobby Saferstein, our program director to wrap our event, Bobby. Thank you, Haley. And uh, thank you all of you at home for joining us for this very important conversation on gun violence prevention. Our Jewish tradition teaches us that to destroy a life is as if to destroy an entire world. Just think about how many lives, how many worlds we could have saved and that we still can save. We encourage you to visit jewishdems.org to learn about all the ways you can take action with JDCA, from advocating our elected officials to passing sensible gun reform legislation, to ending the filibuster to pass the For the People Act and John Lewis Voting Rights and Advancement Acts, and especially in light of last week's Supreme Court ruling to finally passing the Equality Act. You can also learn about our JDCA membership program and how to join one of our 16 state and local JDCA chapters with whom 725 activists completed over 80 individual meetings with elected officials during our inaugural JDCA virtual week of action. There's still time to sign up for our remaining meetings this week. So if you happen to live in Michigan, California, or New York, email outreach at jewishdemos.org. We know that as COVID-19 restrictions are easing across the country, everyone is looking to have a wonderful summer. So I wanna wish you a safe and a happy summer, a very happy Pride Month, and thanks. We know that time is your most valuable resource and we're so grateful that you're spending it with us. Thank you, and we look forward to seeing you at all of our upcoming JDCA events. Take care. <laughs>